So now we have the question and answer session, and um, I have a couple of sheets full of questions, some very good, challenging ones. <laughs> So I'm happy because I brought this wonderful book with me today, which uh, Anna lent me, <laughs> called The Word of the Buddha, I think it is. And it's, uh, it basically covers the four noble truths and the eightfold noble path, and it's directly from the suttas. So it collects various passages throughout the suttas that talk about those places. So sometimes it's the best to just speak from the Buddha's words, you know. So might use it to answer some of these. So there's a couple about our monastery project, um, and I talk a lot about that almost every day. So I'm going to leave those just until the end of this session, yeah? or even, we'll see how it goes, but we could even have maybe 15 minutes about that right at the end of the day. Um, and I'll answer the ones that are more about meditation. So I haven't really read them all yet, so you just get whatever comes out. <laughs> so the first question how can we deal with trauma wisely? When I get re-traumatized, my mind churns at huge speed for four days. And I can't be mindful. It's too overwhelming. How can I make this stop? Okay. I find it easier, actually, to answer real-life people because this is a sort of question on a piece of paper, so I'm not quite sure who you are or how you're feeling right now. <laughs> I guess the first thing I would pick up on here is the, um, the wanting to make it stop because sometimes this is actually one of the things that's fueling it. You know, It's the wanting it to change, the wanting it to stop that's actually perpetuating it because you're feeding it with this kind of negativity and the more it's fed, the more it feeds off the negativity and it can end up just, like you say, going round and round in circles. You know, you're getting into a kind of loop. It's a negative <coughs> feedback system. So with a negative thought comes the kind of negative emotional charge and then, you know, it produces the chemicals like cortisone and all these things that kind of stimulate a kind of fight-flight response. So we end up re-traumatizing ourselves. And it is important to be able to stop the loop at some point. Um, but I think, first of all, we need to have a wise attitude and understand that we want to stop this out of compassion for ourselves rather than out of aversion for the phenomena <laughs> It's a subtle difference. It's a subtle difference, but it's quite important because often when it comes up, we immediately react with not again, not again, you know, rather than exploring, okay, how can I be with this? Like, and how can I meet it fresh, actually? Because we say it's the same thing going over, but each time it will be slightly different. So one thing I would say is um, if it's really strong trauma, it's maybe not wise to kind of sit with it for too long or to try to deal with it all at once. One way that you can work with sensations, because I think it's nice to, you know, if there's a lot of emotional content in the mind and a lot of memories or triggers happening, to get back into the body, to really start to feel the sensations around this. But also not necessarily to go too deeply into them. Sometimes we need to come out a little bit, you know, so you might want to touch in. You might feel sensations that are associated with it, which are unpleasant, and bring them to mind, give them a lot of kindness, but then back off, back off. Perhaps one of the best ways to do it is to meditate for shorter times. And again, as we were saying before, to cultivate, you know, as a foundation for the practice. So I think in daily life, this can be your field. You know, you can start to notice when these thoughts arise and what kind of effect they have and maybe direct them differently or do some other activity that uplifts the mind and takes you out of that for a while. You know, again, service is a very good way to do this because with trauma, you know, we can get kind of one-track minded on this particular problem and we forget about others. <laughs> not to say that it's a selfish state because it's not, you know, it's the result of something that's happened in the past. But uh, sometimes it's good just to back up a little bit and redirect our mind in a healthy way. Yeah? So I would suggest that. And also perhaps looking at loving kindness as a, as a practice. You know, really making much of loving kindness. Because I think when the body and mind are somehow fractured and you know, traumatized, was the word used, um, we're lacking that sort of fundamental sense of well-being which is so necessary for the rest of the practice. So continued practice of metta, even if you don't feel it initially, it fulfills that purpose of substituting a negative thought with a positive thought and 
it's just inclining your mind in a, in a more wholesome direction. You know, so may I be well, may I be free from suffering. And just listening to, to that thought in the mind, listening into it, and just repeating that intention. Even if you don't feel the metta, eventually it will start to change the way you... Yeah, change the way that your mind tends to go. So I would recommend that. But it's kind of difficult without knowing the person, okay? <laughs> Is there anything else I could add? or? Okay, good, good. Yeah, just be very, very kind. Very kind to yourself, very gentle. Yeah, and don't try to do too much at once. <coughs> okay. What do we do if there are some people that we have difficult relationships with and they come up in meditation and to whom we can't send love <coughs> and kindness and we can't forgive the difficult feelings? Stay there. And whom we can't forgive, the difficult feelings stay there. How do we approach that? Yeah. I think, again, I mean, I have my own experience with this. Um, someone I was very, very close to actually <coughs> turned quite violent on me, very violent, and it was very traumatic. <laughs> and some people said to me, oh, you need to send this person meta. And I found that just by bringing this person up in my mind, it was like rolling in the difficulty, you know. It, it was too soon to have to bring them to mind. I needed not to think about this person for quite some time and to focus on my healing, you know rather than focus on trying to send this person meta. That was just re-traumatizing me. So I actually use the um, method that the Buddha talks about in handling, I think it's about meta and how to deal with anger, and one of them is to just ignore the person who you're upset with or who triggers this kind of traumatic response. And it doesn't mean ignore them as in cut them out of your life. It just means put that to one side for a while and focus on getting yourself you know, resourced and balanced with the intention to be able to go back to the same person. You don't have to meet them, but at least bring them to mind with more loving kindness. Sometimes we're just not ready for that. So I think um, it might be good to practice loving kindness meditation with a loved person or with somebody whom you find very easy to practice it with mm -hmm. and just make this a basis for your practice again. And at some point, what happened with me, I was actually doing intensive meta practice at Gaia House quite a few years back, and um, I had stopped trying to send meta to this person, but one day when I was sending meta to the love person and it was flowing really strongly, the thought of this person just came up, and it was as if she just jumped straight <coughs> into this kind of ocean of meta, and it just didn't have an impact. It didn't have the usual, <gasps> and the dreads in my stomach, and the how could that happen? It didn't have any impact like that because there was so much resourcing in myself it's like she just entered that and almost I don't think it strengthened it but it didn't have an effect really and I saw that it's to do with the mind you know it's to do with how ready my mind is there's a simile in the suttas about uh, the salt crystal and the Buddha says um, if you have a salt crystal and you put it in a glass of water can you drink the water and of course the disciples say no venerable sir it'll be very salty and then he said, what if you put that same crystal in an ocean or in a, a freshwater lake? So, you know, would you notice the salt? He said, no, you wouldn't. So there's nothing actually intrinsic in the outside object that's salty, if you like. It's also how that salt meets the present condition. So if our mind is like a big lake, that salt won't have a lot of impact. But if it's coming in and it's filling up the whole mind, then it's not the right time to bring them in. Yeah? So sometimes... You know, we can't handle these things in meditation and we just have to kind of either stop or, yeah, start to practice in a different way, say with metta. Um, just get some distance. Yeah, surround yourself with good people, good friends, and try to let them fall off the screen of the mind a little bit for now. Yeah. So that's one answer. <laughs> Okay, most of, the most of the time the mind stays in the emptiness. Time to time the mind goes into thoughts and feelings. Then it will be back in emptiness again. This is the situation of my practice in Vipassana, kindly seeking advice. Hmm. So I'm not quite <laughs> sure what you mean by emptiness. <laughs> 
Um, it, this can happen when you're practicing with the breath. There can be a point in the practice where things seem to fade away and the body and the breath are not very clear, but you enter some kind of place where nothing much is happening. And some people call that a sort of emptiness. But actually what's happening is that there's nothing particularly obvious in the mind. The mind's quite calm, but it doesn't yet have enough energy to actually penetrate and move further. So it's in a way a bit of a dead end. And what happens at this time is that the instruction is to sort of notice any amount of happiness there or notice something about that, because otherwise it can feel very blank. And I don't know if this is something similar that's happening in your practice. I mean, real emptiness means emptiness of something. It's not actually a state. It's more an understanding that phenomena are empty of a self, are empty of inherent existence. It's not that there's nothing there at all. I mean, unless it's really a very deep state, but I have a feeling this sounds more to me like a sort of a, a kind of blank sort of state. I'm not sure. It's hard to say without speaking to somebody. But I would say perhaps it's helpful to start cultivating happiness in the meditation from the beginning because happiness energizes the mind. And then you may find that, you know, when you go into the thoughts and feelings, there's a little bit more um, energy involved. And perhaps you can start to see subtler and subtler realities rather than slipping off into a sort of empty state. Um, I'm presuming that because this person asked the question, they may feel a little bit stuck. Um, so I do think it'd be, it'd be helpful probably to talk to a teacher and have a bit more instruction on that. Um, it could be that you're coming in contact with a neutral feeling and the mind isn't yet sharp enough to pick that up and so there's a kind of dullness or a sort of boredom happening and you're in a sort of neutral state for a long time. Um, I think it is good to try and break that pattern. Yeah, if possible. I don't know if that helps. <laughs> okay. Next question is about Anapana meditation. Nowadays, it's very difficult to find, it seems to me, a teacher who can guide you all the way to Nibbana, employing the method of Anapanasati meditation exactly in the way taught by the Buddha. What I mean to say is that most teachers advise to look for properties like warmth of the breath or the cold sensation of it. For example, after your meditation develops to a good level. This sort of thing is not mentioned in the Anapanasati Sutta. Could you kindly comment on this? I.e., the 16 stages of Anapana are hardly featured in modern day instructions. That's one question. So I'll try and um, say something about that first of all. Um, I mean, I don't know who, who you're learning this from. But I think looking for properties like the warmth of the breath or the cold sensation is usually something that we do in the beginning of the practice. It's kind of similar to the Buddha's instruction on noticing whether the breath is long or short. And the purpose of this is not to kind of <coughs> stay with that or label anything, but just to get you interested so that you can catch on to the breath. You know, it brings a bit of interest into it. And I think it's the same thing with noticing the warmth and the cold sensation. It's just to get the mind engaged in the beginning. But as you say, it's not really going much deeper than that. You know, that's just the first tetrad in the Anapanasati Sutta. So first of all, it's noticing, you know, the, the qualities, in a sense, of the breath. And later on, we're noticing the whole of the breath. Okay, so at that point, it's like the breath from the very beginning to the very end. So it's more about sustained awareness rather than just noticing, you know, the in or out. So it's like the mindfulness is getting energized. It's able to stay with something for longer periods. And also at that point, the breath can seem to sort of fill the mind, you know. So it's no longer like my mind's here and the breath is just here. It's more like the whole mind becomes the breath and it just suffuses the whole experience. So this is the, the body of the breath, the whole body of the breath. That's how it's uh, discussed. And after that, it's about calming the bodily formation, which again means calming the kind of physical and the breath itself you know, the physical, emotional processes that go along with the breath and the breath itself. And it's something that really happens quite naturally once you're kind of getting into the breath and the mind's with it because there's not a lot of change happening in the breath. So at that point, things tend to settle. And if the mindfulness is sharp enough, you know, it's more like moving into a more neutral, tranquil territory. So it's not 
maybe so kind of immediately impacting. So the mind has to become subtler to tune up with that. Yeah, and then the next four stages. I mean, this the first four stages are in the uh, Satipatthana Sutta, and some teachers say that's a bit strange because only four of them are in the Sutta, and yet the Buddha's saying that the Satipatthana Sutta completes all sixteen stages. So why aren't the other four in the Satipatthana Sutta? The other sets of four in the Satipatthana Sutta, but you could roughly divide them actually into it. You could divide the next one into the um, feelings. So the next one is. Um, the next one is learning to experience PT as you breathe in or out. And PT is a kind of joy, a kind of rapture, which is a mental rapture. You can feel it in the body as well initially, but after a while it becomes more and more mental, so kind of subtler. And this is one of the really uh, important stages in breath meditation because this is the kind of time that you start to get really interested and you don't need any effort anymore to hold the breath. The breath is just, each breath is so beautiful and so delightful that you, you know, you're not going anywhere <laughs> and you can stay with this for days and days. So you experience the piti and then the sukha and the sukha is the happiness as well, the pleasure. It's just slightly more refined than the piti at this stage. But this is still not jhana and I think some teachers misunderstand that and start to say that at this stage it's the first jhana, the second jhana is not actually. We're still not at the stage of nimitta yet. So, and then we learn to calm this mental formation of piti sukha. So this uh, is moving us more into like the uh, tranquility again. Like it's a more refined sense of piti sukha. And then it says, on those occasions, you're mindful of experience, having restrained the five hindrances, energized, fully aware of the purpose and mindful. For being mindful of the pleasure associated with this stage of breath meditation is being mindful of experience. So again, this fulfills Vedana. It fulfills the second Satipatthana because you're aware of feeling at this point. Yeah? So, but you're still at that stage of feeling. You're still not completely in the jhanas yet. And then in the next tetrad, it talks about experiencing the mind. And the way Ajahn Brahm describes that is, uh, <coughs> is experiencing the nimitta. So this is when like the senses are starting to recede in your experience and the mind is becoming predominant. And the mind often manifests with a light. Sometimes it's not always a, a light nimitta. It can also be a feeling nimitta. But it's, it has an appearance of being physical, but it's more mental. I mean, it can happen in Vipassana too, that you're feeling the arising and passing of sensations. And at first it feels physical, but after a while it's more like a light. It's more mental. There's a subtle difference there. And it means you're moving further and further away from the senses as a source of pleasure. Yeah? And then it says you learn to brighten. Well, abhipamojayam chittam is the Pali. Here it says brighten the nimitta or bring joy to the mind. So this is where Ajahn Brahm says that the nimitta can be uh, a light, but it might not be very, very bright. And so at this stage, you're learning to stabilize your attention so that the brightness increases to the point where it's very, very bright and very, very stable. And he says, this is the kind of nimitta which enables you to enter the jhana. So the next uh, stage in this says you learn to liberate the mind. So abhipamojayam no, chittam. Vimochayam chittam. Vimochayam chittam means the mind... Yeah, you learn to liberate the mind. It doesn't mean the mind is fully enlightened. It means it's liberated from the five senses. Okay. And vimochayam is often used in, in, in regard to the, uh, to the states of samadhi, not to the states of liberation. So he would interpret that as entering the jhana. And so, yeah, breath meditation can go all the way to full enlightenment, but uh, the next question on here is how important are the jhanas for liberation? And I think if you're going through the Anapanasati Sutta and most of the suttas in the text, pretty much the jhanas are always there as one of the stages that you need to go through. It's like we were saying earlier, you know, you can dig a hole with a kind of spade and you might be able to get to the bottom of the hole, but it's going to be a lot harder than doing it with a digger. <laughs> yeah? When you have a digger, you can take out more than you would in like a week, you know, months and months and months. You can take it all out at once. So, um, yeah. And the, the level of mindfulness after the jhana is uh, quite incomparable with mindfulness before the jhana so in this in the text it talks about um it says that basically after jhana the mind is 
uh, malleable, bright, wieldy, and fit for work. And, he, and the Buddha likens it to gold. He says, you purify the gold of the impurities, like brass, tin, copper, whatever. That's the five hindrances. And eventually, once it's purified, it becomes gold, and it becomes very soft, and you can use it for whatever you want to. And that means that your mind is so strong, and it has no bias, no preference. It can really focus on any ex- any area of experience. You know, probably one of the areas in the Satipatthana, or it can even be through reflective power, like looking back on the jhana and understanding what just happened. And there can be then, at that point, a deep insight into non-self. So it's much, much more likely to happen after the jhana. And there are countless references to this in the text. Countless. Samadhi pachaya yatabhu tanyana dasana means uh, samadhi is the cause for seeing things as they truly are. Yeah. But again, this is a gradual process, and it doesn't mean that insights, deep insights, don't happen before jhanas, because there can be a state of absence of hindrances even before the jhanas. But it's less, it's less uh, stable. The jhanas, can, the hindrances, can more easily come back into the mind at that point. So, but it's not, you know, it's a gradual process, and you know, most people haven't experienced jhanas you know, for long periods or repeatedly, you know, it's quite a rare practitioner who has that kind of instant sort of skill in jhana. And it's very much based on, like, your ethics, your conduct, the way you learn to skillfully use your mind. Um, It's a natural process. So I think the more you realise it's a natural process and you see that letting go leads to, you know, increased joy, increasing happiness on the path, the more you realise, okay, it's just going to happen in its own time. So, yeah, people do tend to just go through these things, and they can happen suddenly, too. They can happen when you least expect them. So, yeah. But it's good not to stop there. (laughs) Understand the purpose of why we're developing these samadhi states. I hope that helps a bit. Um, Yeah. Is right effort the area where we deal with the hindrances? So it's a good question. Um, And I think it is one of the main areas. I mean, certainly right effort in the suttas tends to come before we sit down to meditate. So it's kind of the bridge between our sila and then sitting down in, you know, and developing our awareness and our samadhi. But really, we're dealing with the hindrances you know, throughout the path, also the practice of ethics deals with the hindrances, you know, you're not giving in to them, you're kind of cultivating new ways of behaving, so this is also helping. But yeah, right effort really helps to undermine the hindrances, and um, they may not be fully abandoned at that stage, which is why we then go on to practice the Satipatthana and to, yeah, to practice anapana meditation also, and this, you know, gradually undermines the the more subtle hindrances that are obstacles to the jhanas. They can be very subtle. Yeah. So we can undermine the hindrances no matter what we're doing. <laughs> How is breath meditation an insight practice? <laughs> yeah. Anything that leads to insight is an insight practice. (laughs) Yeah? Insight is not a practice, it's a result of a practice. So, you know, there is the word vipassana meditation, and for years I was practicing exclusively that vipassana practice. And I thought, I guess I thought that that was insight in itself, but I also knew that I hadn't had, you know, very, like, liberating insight. So really, I mean... (sighs) It's the way we relate to experience that causes the insights. It's you know how far we learn to let go, how wisely we relate to experience. It's not the practice in itself. And I think for some people, breath meditation you know, yields a lot of insights. One of the ways it does that is because you really have to let go a lot to enter something like a deep state of samadhi. You really have to let go of this doing kind of control freak inside yourself because as I said earlier every time you kind of think right I got it you know then it all it all falls back again (laughs) so it's you know it's quite nice when you read the Anapanasati Sutta because it very clearly says that you know you experience joy 
And this is the point where you can start to let go a bit more. And at this point, it's like a feedback loop. The more you let go, the more joy arises. Every time you lean into it, it recedes. <laughs> so it's really clear what's going on, you know. And that is quite insightful. That's really quite insightful, if you understand what's going on. So no type of meditation is in itself insight, but um, they can all lead to insight. And as I said, you know, when you, the mind's clear from hindrances, you have more chance of looking deeply into the nature of phenomena. Yeah, things like suffering and non-self and impermanence. So anything that leads to, you know, reducing the hindrances basically will lead to insight. Okay, I'm still avoiding the Bikuni uh, project questions. <laughs> I feel that I do have anger, grumpiness, unsatisfaction and other negative things in my life. Ha, huh. join the club. <laughs> <laughs> Today felt complex. <coughs> Today or you felt complex? <laughs> I'm just being playful. Where do you think is a good a good place to start would be? I think right where you are now is a really good place to start. And just opening your heart to the anger and the grumpiness, you know, because sometimes these are our teachers. I mean, the Buddha did teach that first noble truth of suffering. Suffering exists, you know, it's universal. It's just one of the realities. And if we never experience suffering, how would we ever develop empathy for others or compassion? You know, I really reflect on that when I'm going through a period of difficulty, which happens a lot in monastic life and in any life, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, I, yeah, sometimes say, for example, with this situation that happened when someone physically abused me, and it wasn't, it wasn't even the physical, she was a friend, so it was really traumatic. Um, but I knew that, you know, no matter how difficult it was, that I'd have more compassion and understanding after that for other people who'd been abused. You, know? you hear about people who can't leave an abusive situation, and I used to think that's ridiculous, I would leave if anybody even raised their voice, you know. But actually you think, oh dear, you know, they were suffering, it was, you know, a mistake, they really regret it, I'll just give them another go, you know. And it happened twice to me because I gave them another go. <laughs> so, but yeah, the whole time I was just reflecting on the fact that now I understand more, I can develop more empathy to others and um, it's going to help me in the long run. Yeah. And I mean, it did make me feel quite vulnerable, but vulnerability is also something very beautiful. It's a place we can connect with each other, you know, without the mask. <laughs> I had another experience which uh, Karen was there for in Brighton because I went to teach at the Brighton Bodhi Tree and uh, I felt really ill <laughs> most of the day because I think I'd eaten something the day before and it was the afternoon meditation and I was just like, okay, just you know, try and make peace with this feeling but I was really green, really green and I was thinking, okay, it's just 10 more minutes till the end of the meditation I can go around the corner to the toilet, five more minutes and the toilet wasn't even a separate room. It was just behind like a little um, Japanese screen. <laughs> and then I was just sick into my mouth and then sick everywhere. It just flew everywhere. And it was kind of interesting. I felt quite high after that. <laughs> <laughs> I think one thing was the relief of getting it out. But then when I came back in, I mean, obviously everybody knew that I just made this terrible noise and some people helped clean it up even. <laughs> and, uh, and I just felt like, oh. Like, there's nothing now between me and anyone else. It's like, you couldn't really be much more kind of open than that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I actually think it was really funny. I did come back in laughing quite a lot. <laughs> so, yeah, make friends with anger and grumpiness. Ajahn Brahm gave a grumpy license to somebody in Perth because they said, oh, you're always telling us to be happy. You know, I'm not happy, I'm grumpy. <laughs> So he said, okay, let me go into the office and make you a grumpy license. And it said something like, this allows the owner to be grumpy at any time of day for any reason whatsoever or with no reason. <laughs> and then she laughed and he said, that's not the point. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, anger, grumpiness and all that stuff that we call negative is just part of life and it's not always there. And if things are complex, just uh, try to simplify, maybe just give yourself some kindness. I can't really go on about metta and compassion enough, but sometimes we can just pick, like, get a feeling for how you feel and just what is your deepest wish for yourself, you know, and just keep on bringing that up in the mind and in the heart and just sit with that for a bit, yeah? 
Okay. In the Satipatthana Sutta, the phrase ekayano maggo is mentioned. That means, uh, I'll tell you in a minute. Does this imply that the rest of the path factors will naturally unfold if mindfulness is developed? In other words, although it is like a single fold path, would it lead to developing the eightfold path eventually? Ha ha. So this is the problem with the translation of the word ekai and omago because often it's been translated as the one and only path and actually it's a wrong translation. <laughs> I can say it with confidence because I really trust my teachers. They're really good scholars of Pali and it's been understood now for a while amongst teachers like Bhante Analyo and Ajahn Brahmali and Bhikkhu Bodhi. They no longer translate that as the one and only path because it is an eightfold path and to say it's you know, a one-fold path means it's like baking a cake with flour and no eggs and butter and sugar or anything else. It's just not going to rise. <laughs> it's just going to be all yucky. So um, the word ekayano mago actually means, ah, you know, I think it comes from yana, you know, yano, ekayano, like mahayana means vehicle. So I think it means the one direction, the path which leads in one direction only, like yana going in one direction. So that's the way it's now understood. Like It means that if you practice this path, it will take you to enlightenment. But the Satipatthana, which I hope I've conveyed today, includes all the other aspects of the path. It's one part of the gradual training, which helps to undermine the final hindrances and leads to insight and samadhi. But you need every factor of the path. You can't possibly have mindfulness without ethics. You know, what are you mindful of? Just hurting other people? You know, we can't have that. So, but in a sense, what do you say, that will naturally unfold, the other ones will naturally unfold if mindfulness is developed. Mindfulness and wisdom together, I mean, you need to know where to direct the mindfulness. I mean, if you're just mindful of feeding docs or mindful, I don't know, there's some kind of mindfulness and aromatherapy um, mindfulness training nowadays where they just put aromatherapy with some mindfulness practices. And it's all to indulge the senses, actually. I'm not sure that that's going to lead in the same direction so it's one direction only because the purpose of it is liberation <laughs> so we need to keep the purpose very clearly in mind and all the path factors do feed into the others you know if we perfect our right view I mean naturally you're a stream winner but if uh, that's deepened then that will naturally lead into lead to the others deepening yeah so they all feed into each other and strengthen each other. But I think it's really lovely that they do because it shows you that meditation isn't only something that happens on the cushion. You know, you can be practicing other factors of the noble path in your daily life. Maybe you can't practice, you know, satipatthana and samadhi without sitting on a cushion or doing some pretty uh, focused walking meditation at least. But you can be practicing right speech. You know, not just the abstinence part, but the active part of right speech, for example. And I'll just read a few because I did bother to bring it um, because I just think it's lovely about speech. So uh, let's have a look. So apart from abandoning false speech, one speaks truth, adheres to truth, is trustworthy and reliable. Abandoning malicious speech does not repeat elsewhere what she's heard here to divide, reunites those who are divided, promotes friendships, enjoys, rejoices, and speak words that promote harmony. Yeah? So we can really have fun with this if we see it as part of the noble path. It's like quite encouraging, isn't it, that by doing this we're going to beautify the mind so that when it does come to the point where we can sit, we're going to be in a much better place to start with. We can also bring it up. That's another aspect of mindfulness I wanted to touch into. There's an aspect which is about recollection. And um, the six recollections that the Buddha talked about, and it's um, basically bringing up certain subjects in the mind. So one of them is uh, chaganu sati, which means recollecting one's own virtuous conduct. So we can actually sit down and bring up the things that we've done during the day. So for me, this is quite important at the moment because I'm really, really tired working with this project because really I'm sort of doing about 80% of the work and it really requires a team of about 10 people. So um, one of the ways that I energize my mind is to remember at the end of the day or at the beginning of the meditation that you know everything I'm doing is going to help people in the long run. It's going to serve others. You know, This is going to bring Dhamma to people. It's at least going to provide a space which is safe where people can come and stay. You know, And so I can reflect like this and I can say, okay, this service that I'm doing 
is going to produce happiness for people. And also reflecting on all the kindness that does come along and the people who just come forward and say, we really want to help, you know, in any way that you want us to, we're here for you. You know, this is just so beautiful to see that this is a project that includes everybody, actually. And so I reflect like this, and it's not an egotistical thing. It's more a kind of, okay, this particular activity leads to benefit in the world. And by bringing that up in my mind, I gladden my mind. I mean, one, that's one of the ways I practice breath meditation. I first bring up happiness in the mind before I even get onto the breath. So it's not like long, short, whole breath, and then finally we get joy with the breath. Most of the time I either do this kind of reflection or a lot of metta practice, and there's already this sense of joy and well-being. So when you go to the breath, it's really it appears beautiful to the mind. So that's the Chaganusati. And there were some monks in the Buddha's day who did that. I think it was that. They reflected on um, the virtue of their companions in the holy life. And it says they um, got into the deep states of samadhi through uh, mudita, which is the third Brahma Vihara. It means like uh, sympathetic joy or a kind of rejoicing kind of joy. So they'd rejoice in each other's goodness. <coughs> and they actually got into the deep states of uh, meditation that way. And ultimately became fully enlightened. So these are also aspects of sati, bringing up wholesome recollections. Another one is death, maranānu sati. So they all have the word sati. So it just means sati that goes along with contemplation of death. So there are many kind of little helpful practices we can do that all kind of lead us towards being ready for the deeper meditation practice. So... That went off at quite a tangent. (laughs) Um, How are we doing for time? Would you like me to talk about the Bikuni Project now, or would you like some meditation, and then we have 15 minutes at the end? Who wants to talk about the Bikuni Project now? Who wants to have 15 minutes at the end? Oh. I think it sort of fell on now, sort of. It was pretty much 50-50. Okay. (laughs) I won't say too much about it, but uh, where's the question? Please say at least a little about the Bikini Project, how it came about, its aims, and how it's going. And someone else said, uh, how is the search for the monastery venue going? Well, the monastery venue is a bit far off yet. (laughs) But the project came about because my teacher in Perth asked me to come back here and start something for nuns. It was just kind of more like a, a sort of idea. We, we, but we had it together, actually. I say he made me do it. <laughs> <laughs> but I sort of said, what do you think about doing something in England? And he jumped on it. He said, yeah, go to England and do something. And I thought, OK, I'll just go and see how things feel. But I had my ticket back to Perth, so I never intended to stay here at all. But then I thought about it a bit, and I said to him, well, you know, if we're going to start anything, you're going to have to come and teach. And by the way, would you be the spiritual advisor? Because, you know, I'm not doing this on my own. And he said, yeah, sure. And I was like, oh, okay. (laughs) (laughs) So I had nowhere to stay. I really didn't know anybody. And I thought, oh, this is crazy. So I spoke with my abbot back in Perth, and she said, well, you know, I had my ticket back. And she said, yeah, you can come back, but how are you going to organize the retreats and stuff if, if you're... In, in Australia and I said oh yeah true but I'm not really ready to leave Perth and she said well I think you should just go with this and I knew because Ajahn Brahm's behind it it's gonna something's gonna happen I don't know it was a kind of trust and it was also the feeling of gratitude I have towards him as my teacher knowing what he sacrificed to you know try to give women this platform and this opportunity and also because I've been in Perth and I see that there aren't many opportunities you know there's only a few monasteries and more over there than in most places and there were women who, you know, want to have this opportunity that don't find somewhere they resonate with. So monks have so many different places, you know. They can, first of all, choose exactly where to go based on the teacher in that place. <clears throat> if they don't like that place or if they need a break, which people do need, you know, you need maybe just to explore some other places sometimes. They can. They can go to all the branch monasteries or they can go to another country like Burma or Sri Lanka or, you know, they can go anywhere, really whereas we can't. So I think we always need more places. And I guess also seeing that at some point 
when women don't feel that they have equal opportunities to men, it starts to undermine their confidence and have a sort of detrimental psychological effect, I think. It's like being told, you know, you're not quite as good, or you can be, but you have to work harder than the men. And um, this shouldn't really be the case in Buddhism. I also met a lot of lay people who find it really disheartening, you know, that women don't have the same opportunities, and some who actually disrobe because of that, and also some who don't want to call themselves Buddhist because of that, you know. So this is really quite a big problem, and the Buddha said that we need the monks, nuns, lay men, lay women, for Buddhism to, to thrive and survive. You know, we could say, oh, we don't need Buddhism, we just need meditation, but you do need the whole context of the teachings for meditation to have success. You don't have to call yourself Buddhist, even I try not to, but I can't get away with it anymore. <laughs> You know, <laughs> that's not really the point. But, you know, the aspiration to ordain and that kind of longing in the human heart, I think, is universal and goes back into, you know, obviously at least 2,600 years and probably before that. So there will be people who want this opportunity, and so that's what motivates me. Um, but getting back to where we are with it, I mean, we actually have quite a lot of money now. We have 750,000. I don't really spread that around, but now it's on the tapes. But that's only because I don't want the pressure of having to get something before we're ready. Because I think, although our finances are quite healthy, we don't yet have an established enough team. And I'm basically managing all the volunteers and doing most of the retreat organization. And I'm spending most of my life online, honestly. In the past half an hour, and I had a headache. Now I'm like sometimes from 8 in the morning till 11 at night. And people say, try and have breaks. And it's like... If I do that, I'll be working without any retreat time, you know. So I work very hard at the moment. So that has to change. We need probably a project manager, maybe an admin. So we're thinking about having a contracted temporary employee, something like this, somebody who wants to serve a Dhamma project and is happy to have some kind of, um, yeah, some kind of financial contribution but it's not going to be too much because at the moment we don't have like regular we have regular donations but the reason we have so much is that we got one huge donation of 400,000 from one anonymous donor so um, that was one of Ajahn Brahm's sort of miracles he sometimes has these amazing people coming forward and saying we've got this money where would you like it to go and he said send it to England so so yeah that's when I realized it had to happen (laughs) <laughs> yeah. So, but the next steps really are to find me somewhere to actually stay because I don't have anywhere to stay and it's very tiring to move around all the time and you know I bought my whole office here today and you know my kit for the next two months and actually three or four months <laughs> and I go back to Australia for the rains retreats uh, so far so at least I have that three months with my teacher but uh, it's hard work And you're all welcome to contribute, and I hope that you'll all come and visit, at least before we're finished. (laughs) Paint the windows or something. (laughs) Yeah. Good. Um, So we've had 45 minutes, which was kind of what I thought would be suitable, but if anybody has any other questions that they either don't want recorded or just want to ask from the floor, please feel free. We can do another 10 minutes if you want. <clears throat> so just ask a general question about where you, where you want to, uh, your street to be yeah I keep saying it sort of depends on where the support base is but I'm not sure uh, which comes first <laughs> so we think not too far from London maybe within an hour, an hour and a half um, but we're sort of envisaging that it may be a one-step or a two-step process. If it's a one-step process, we could immediately buy something or rent something, say, an hour, an hour and a half out of the city. In the two-step plan, we would rent first, more or less, in Greater London, like so that we could establish more of a support base and then move out a bit further away. So we're not sure, but I kind of feel drawn to... Well, there's a lovely group in Essex, you see, and a lot of people are here from there today, and I know they'd like me over there, so that's a possibility. But also there's Brighton and Lewis and those kind of areas where there's a lot of Buddhists and practitioners, so that's another area we're interested in. Um, Could be Cambridge, could be Oxford, could be... I don't know. I'd actually like it in Devon, but Ajahn thinks it's too far. (laughs) (laughs) 
I don't know. Yeah, thanks. Was there another question? I just wanted to know yeah. what uh, we talked about regular meetings in London. Oh, uh, yeah. Is that? Well, I did mention it to someone else today. We tried to do these meetings in London sort of last year, but because of my um, hectic lifestyle, normally when I'm coming through London, I only have time to sort of land and then, I don't know, gather myself for the next whatever it is. And it's just very hard to kind of fit in. But um, one idea, because I know there are a lot of people here who want to volunteer and who have been volunteering, and we don't have a base to meet at, and so we feel a bit fragmented. We don't meet each other very much. So one idea that came to mind is that at, uh, is hiring a small room, say at somewhere like Jamyang. I think you can hire quite a small room for not too much money and just doing that once a month, say. But I think it'd be better if it came from the lay people because I can't always come. And if I'm arranging it and you know it's a lot of work for me to arrange and then I can't make it, it's quite, it just falls away, it just falls apart. So, yeah. We'll see. I mean, if you know people write to me afterwards and people express an interest or want to get together with each other, then we could put <coughs> something in motion. There isn't a lot of time this year, but I think from next year, definitely, we're going to start doing this because I'm going to have to start looking for a base. After, when I say next year, I mean after the rains <laughs> this year. So that's kind of December time, November, December time. We we'll start looking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, from what you were saying, is there like a sort of sequential, is it kind of a sequential process? Yeah. Way? As in like, are you saying that it's certain, there's, there's certain things that one should work on as first before going on to other things? Um. <coughs> As in if you look at the text, then yes, but in real life it doesn't really work that way. I mean, in real life we often start with meditation. I mean, I did. But the retreat structure was such that I was automatically not breaking precepts and I was also having a chance to develop, you know, the mind, settle the mind and, you know, also to take up the meditation. But I think it's in later years that I've realized you can strengthen the meditation by focusing on things outside of formal sitting and those can be going on all the time and they all feed into each other. But, yeah, I mean, if you look at people who do tend to get very deep experiences quite quickly, they've usually got the other things pretty much established first. At least if it's going to sustain itself. I mean, there can be kind of instant, deep, one-off experiences, but they don't tend to last. So it's like the stronger the foundations, the stronger the building is going to be on those foundations. So we can keep on putting in, you know, we can actually work at every level throughout our lives. It's not like we can't get to the bottom level if, you know, again, we can. So it's a refining the whole thing. But, yeah, I mean, there is a natural kind of, you know, for example, if you restrain the senses and there's less agitation in the mind because of that, then it follows that the sati, when you sit, is going to be stronger. You know, it's a kind of preparation. Yeah. So the idea of the... the um, I don't know all of the bits. Yeah, yeah. It's all sort of Together, but yeah. the idea of have, like having the precepts in have work, like cultivate, cultivated notes as a kind of foundation yeah. for the city. Yeah. I hadn't really looked at it that way. Right, 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 right. I sort of looked yeah. at it. I mean yeah. like, the, med- the meditation informs me of my life. Yeah. Outside yeah, of yeah. sitting down. Mm-hmm. But I hadn't necessarily directly thought about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, it's true. But because I've got the sense you were saying with the hindrances that they that it was good to get kind of bit of a handle on those before going yeah. into some of the other practices? Is that right? Yeah, I guess I'm just trying to emphasise that there's a lot we can do about them outside of sitting also. Mm-hmm. And so if we... It, it's also a way of having more continuity of practice. Mm-hmm. You know, because one of the problems that can happen, they call it in America the yogi mind. Mm-hmm. People go straight into retreat, but they haven't yet cultivated the sort of way they... a way of life outside that's conducive to continuing it. The practice. So they come outside and they're very sensitive, but they don't know how to handle that experience. It's like a sudden onslaught of the senses. Whereas if you've cultivated a bit of right effort, you realize that, okay, the mindfulness I develop now is not appropriate to the situation I'm in now. Now I need to change the focus a little bit. And so at that point, you can have a more kind of a broader kind of spherical level of awareness, which is more about like noticing the impact coming in at the sense doors, for example. And you can practice with that, or you can practice to kind of, yeah, with the thoughts. If you see yourself going off into negative thinking, you can focus on that. Or 
you can focus, like I was saying, on something productive in the community, like service or these kind of things, and you notice that these things are helping you to maintain a regular practice. Whereas before that, it was just either you're in the retreat or you're out and you're just the same as you were before. There's a little chart I brought to show something really interesting that one of the teachers in America, uh, who's one of my closest Kalyanamitas, like spiritual friends on the path, and uh, he talked about mindfulness as having a different distance from the objects. I don't know if you can see it, but you can come and see afterwards if you want. Basically, like these are the objects on this side of the paper. And this is the mindfulness and how close it is to the object. So in samadhi, it's absolutely in the object. It's unified. In vipassana, it's a bit further away, but it's still very, very close because the mindfulness is quite strong and penetrative. But then there's another level, which is like mindfulness and clear comprehension. So not satipatthana mindfulness, but just the preliminary mindfulness, which is aware of going forward, backward, purpose, this kind of thing. And that's, again, a bit further. So that's when we're kind of walking or doing things in daily life. And then restraint of the senses is even further back from the object. It's more kind of like what's coming in from the outside. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's like learning kind of which thing is the best to practice at a given time or in a given context. Yeah, I hope that helps. (laughs) (laughs) Don't panic, I know it's embarrassing. (laughs) It's a bit of a cheer. Probably means it's the end of the Q&A session. (laughs) Good. So um, how about we have...